Welcome again. Uh, first of all, I want to thank VMware for hosting us. Thank you, VMware. Thank you for us. <laughs> um, also, want to thank uh, our sponsors. So we know that Google has been sponsored through JavaScript now. So that's that's ideal for Google. Um, JetBrains has been a sponsor for a long time. And, you know, raffle off some intelligent licenses. If you haven't, if you don't have it already. <laughs> Uh, and JFrog is going to be a sponsor of the meeting. So thank you, JFrog. So tonight we have three talks. We have two lightning talks um, on web power testing tool. Um, and we have it on our uh, native job compilation in the Java cloud, uh, excuse me, Google Cloud. Uh, and of course, Cora is going to talk about the uh, uh, build packs. So uh, very exciting. So uh, I just also point out that the abstracts were tweaked by ChatGPT, <laughs> <laughs> and the image was created by Dolly. <laughs> and I gave it the abstract. I said, "Create a funny invitation," and that's the image it created. You know, Mark, Mark, ChatGPT for everything. I'm gonna try to. Yeah, and it's like it's like a Grammarly plus plus. You know, it's not replacing everything. It's like a Grammarly plus plus. You know, for scraps. It's a tool. If you need the tool. Right? Um, but I did, and I wrote my first chat GPT program, you know, Perl scripts, and I discovered something interesting. I, I asked chat GPT to write a program that duplicated itself in yeah. Perl, and it gave me back like a five line. It's like, okay, this is not to cut and paste it, and it didn't work. And so, oh, you know, come on. So I went to the docs, and it, apparently there was some parameter, HTTP thing, parameters that were off. Then I found out that chat GPT has no knowledge of the past few years. So it was using a stale API. Oh, yeah. so, yes. so I did use the docs, <laughs> but then I got the docs and got to work. And then I asked it to write a Java FX version of the same thing. Then it gave me back a two page working version of the Java X program. And it literally took like 10 seconds. You let compile it I just cut and pasted it with Intelligent. So it was like, no, 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 no. It's, it's a, it's, lives are going to be different. It's not going to lose our jobs, it's our lives are going to be different. So, yeah, we won't be working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, we're still getting paid. <laughs> um, all right, so let me uh, turn over to the Mikla, the, our first speaker, and I'll, I'll set the timer for 10 minutes. Just you put it on the mute. Oh, thank you. Let me know when you start the timer. Maybe you can start now so he doesn't know. Save the menu. Oh, it's TV set. Yeah. Ooh. Perfect. All right. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Nick Golbiff, and today I'm going to show you how can you simplify your unit and end-to-end -end test using WebTower API. Now we'll start with a business logic data preparation. And we're going to be implementing a test game store checkout process. We want to implement discount logic. So we're going to be buying games and going to get discount based on what games we purchase. The logic is going to be simple. It's going to depend on how many distinct types we buy. And if those games we buy are more than $15, they're eligible. And let's say we have two distinct types more than $15, we're going to get 20% discount. Let's put it into data so we all understand. We're going to check out four games. Two of them have a price more than $15. They're all distinct types of a genre, 20% discount. So now let's implement it in Java and write a unit test for it. Now its implementation is going to be straightforward, taking the list of games, going to filter through, make sure they're more than $15 in price, get the types, get distinct values of them, count them, and limit by three using the mass main function. Right? So we know we're going to get either 10, 20, 30, or zero. Now let's write a test.
to be able to test this logic. And we're going to start with the boilerplate approach uh, to creating those instances. We're going to create instance one, set, 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 instance two, set, set, set. We're going to get tired eventually. What's going to happen is we're probably not going to create enough of them or just three of them, all going to be copy pasting and missing some values. So we're going to write this test using one of the WebTower APIs I want to show you. And this is the table API. A table lets you create a data in a tabular form and then manipulate this data to actually build your domain objects. I also provide you things like cell GUID to automatically generate ID fields. And now since it's easy to create these things, we're going to create three entries for PG with different prices, multiple entries for FPS, and we're going to create one sport type game. So we have at least four distinct types, right? Now we have sufficient number of games instances to test our logic. After that, we create a discount calculator, get the games and make sure the uh, value is the one we expect. So that was about the data creation. Now let's take a look at how we actually create those games. As I mentioned, table data is an API of WebTAL. Think of it as a list of maps, or like a ray list on steroids. We stream the, the rows of the table and map each row to the game object. And what's important here is up to us how we create this game object. We can default to certain values. If, for example, title is not present in the table, we say, okay, it's empty. For the price, we do the same. Basically, we know our domain. We know what's important and what's not. From a testing point of view, we only specify the columns we're interested in. All right, so that was about how we create a data as an input, but what about the output? Let's consider the logic data, business logic data validation. Our game server has a recommendation agent. Based on the games you played, a time, the genre, it's going to let you know what the next game you want to play. When your boy's like, just give me the next game to play. We start again with data creation. We'll use a table we just saw, but this time we're going to create a library of games. And you notice there is a fourth column out called hours played. It, it's something we didn't have before. Uh, we're going to create a recommendation engine, pass the library, and now create uh, make our first complex validation. What we're going to do is compare the Java bin that returns from our recommended next game to a map and the map inside. So it's like a complex object. We're going to run our test, but there is a problem in our test or the problem in our logic that we introduced. So let's see what WebTower is going to output for you on the screen. It's going to say, hey, I was expecting next game to equal this complex object. Something went wrong. The type was expected to be sport, but it's actually RPG, so there is a bug. And let me show you the more context. Let me show you the actual object you had and highlight you the things that are mismatched there. Now, instead of just saying true or false, instead of just saying like, we expected A cut B, you get way more information, and in the context of this information, you can see a lot of details. So that was an object and a map, but let's see if, there, if we can do even more complex types. We have another class. Uh, another thing we want to test is a game library class has the top two, top n games. You call this method, you specify n, and you get like top two games, top three games. So let's test this method. We're going to start again with creating our games, library games using the table. Uh, going to use new API I'm introducing the trace. Trace is another WebTAL API that's going to let you pretty print all the complex objects you want. And then we're going to call the find top two games. But this time, instead of comparing one game at a time, uh, we're going to compare a list of games with a table data. We're going to table our expectations, like ID type, all of that, and make a comparison. So we say top two games should equal this table. We're going to run our test. And the first thing we're going to see is a trace. We will try the trace call. It's going to do is print your objects. And if those objects have objects inside, it's going to print those as well. And as we're tracing it during our test debug, for example, we're immediately going to see that, ah, the price is now. But let's just keep, keep going. Now, we're expecting the top two games to equal this table. And WebTower will tell you, hey, there is now. You expect something else. And as in previous case, it's going to print you the uh, whole actual objects and highlight you the, the failed expectations. We did the validation using the table data, but let's just remember how you would do it or how you probably do it today uh, when you're not using WebTAL. Again, you get the two, two games from the library, uh, top two games, and then field by field, you compare, you compare, you compare. What happens here, you stop seeing wood for the trees. There's quite a high noise to value ratio. And what also might potentially happen is you start copy pasting. Like it's annoying. You copy paste and you put the value, your own values and stuff like that. So let's put it in comparison. A boilerplate and hard to see data and pure data focused uh, table validation. All right. So we took a look at the unit test and business logic. 
let's take a look at some infrastructure testing or black box like end-to-end -end stuff. Uh, WebTow has the endpoint, or the, not WebTow, the game server we're writing has a endpoint to return you all the games and in the format in the format of list of objects. And that's what we want to test. And we're going to start testing it with by defining the database table, by declaring, saying like we have a games table in a database somewhere. We want to clear it, insert entries into this table using the camel case optionally, going to be converted to snake case. We're going to trace again just to see how it looks. And finally, make an HTTP call to the API slash game. And inside, we're going to perform two validations. One is a pinpoint precise validation saying the first entry in the array type should equal RPG. And the second one is more like a bulk testing, where we say the entire body should be equal in this table of two columns. Let's run it and see what's going to happen on the screen. A lot of things is printed for you out of the box. Things like, hey, I'm creating a data source. I'm inserting rows. I'm tracing your games. And now we can see the snake case here. And finally, executing an HTTP call with a full URL, not the relative one. And assertions done for you, uh, assertions you did and assertions are done for you, like status code equals 200. You didn't do assertions for status code, you got this one. And more importantly, you're going to see the response. Fail to not, you're going to get the entire response of your endpoints. And the values you touch are going to be highlighted by those underscores. And, and later, you will know why it's important. All right. So, WebTel already produces you a lot of reports on the console output. You do nothing. You just compare things. You create things. You see a lot of useful information. But WebTel gives you more. It gives you an actual web report. It's a single HTML file, self-contained. You can take this file, select to anyone, email to anyone, open it. And when you open this file, you're gonna, you can drill to any test, see the failure reasons. But more importantly, you can drill to past tests and see the, the calls you made, the assertions you made. Right? All this green stuff here is the assertions you performed. And WebTow actually uses this data to provide response data coverage later. It's a lightning talk. Frank is looking at me. There is so much more. There is so much things in this WebTow. It's been built for the last four years using two enterprises. There's like REPL mode, coverage, open API integrations, performance browser, GraphQL, CLI, fake, test containers as well. But don't be alarmed. It's all modularized. You want to use unit testing only, you use it. You want to use all of it, you use it. You want to just browser API test in Selenium wrapper, go for it. All right, so I think it's all for the talk. There is a GitHub. You need to go there, start WebTow. If you go there, you also see a Discord link. It's a server I created like a couple of weeks ago. Join the Discord. I'm on a garden leaf. I have time to chat. I can help you bootstrap. You know, I have my friend here, hopefully going to help him use it as well at his team. All right, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, you are now unmuted. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Ridula Fezada, uh, as was mentioned before, and I'm a software engineer at Google Cloud. And today, I am actually very excited to be in my first ever Java Fig. And I'll be talking about um, optimizing your Java applications on Google Cloud with the help of meta image compilation. Uh, but briefly, before we begin the lightning talk, um, just as an overview, uh, what will we be talking about? So first, um, I'll give a quick intro, a uh, very high-level intro into meta image compilation, um, what it means in terms of support with our Google Cloud client libraries in Java and also the performance benefits that we've observed uh, using this technology. Uh, so first, what is meta image compilation? Uh, this technology has been gaining a lot of traction in the Java community. Um, and essentially, it's a technology that allows us to pre-compile our Java code ahead of time into um, 
architecture and OS specific executables, also known as native images. Uh, so usually in standard Java, um, we end up interpreting and further compiling our code at application runtime. But AOT or ahead of time compilation has takes the flip approach uh, where all the code that's reachable to your application is compiled at image build time. So as you're building your native image. Um, and this comes with a lot of performance benefits. Uh, one is reduced code startup times, which is great uh, if you want to containerize your application. And it also comes with the benefit of lower memory usage. So normally native images don't really require a JVM to run. And that allows us to get rid of a lot of the infrastructure and metadata that would otherwise be necessary for a standard Java application. Uh, so that's a bit about the benefits on a high level. Um, and in the previous slide, I kind of talked about uh, the omitting of the extra infrastructure and metadata being an advantage. Uh, but that also comes with certain risks, especially when you're using more um, dynamic loading in your Java code, uh, especially with resource loading. And um, if you're reflectively calling your methods in a class, you may run into errors such as a no such file exception or no such method exception at runtime. And in order to be able to address that, we actually need to provide the native image compiler with certain metadata and configurations that specify that this resource needs to be accessible at runtime. Uh, similarly, we also have to, we may run into cases where we have to register certain classes and methods for reflection. Um, and that can be done statically in a JSON file using the naming convention that the new image team provides us under the metadata native image directory, or they can also be done dynamically using the Graalvium features interface. Um, but starting with 25.4 of the cloud libraries bill of materials, or even if you're using the latest version of the client libraries, these libraries come with the configurations built in uh, so that if you perform native image compilation, it's kind of an out of the box experience without the need for any additional configurations from the user's perspective. Um, and on, on a very high level in terms of like three steps that I've shown uh, in this slide, um, how does this work if we're applying native image compilation with the libraries? So first we need to ensure that the libraries form 25.4 or later is being used in our project. And this slide kind of exemplifies how you can do that in a form.xml. Uh, but you can also do that in Gradle, but I just use Maven in this case for illustrative purposes. Um, second comes the stage of actually compiling your application into a native image. And that can be done by leveraging the native build tools, the native Maven plugin, or the native Gradle plugin. Or you can even do that when um, by explicitly uh, making use of the native image extension from your CLI. Um, and in this particular case, uh, we've attached the native maiden plugin with a profile, a native profile, which can then be used with the maven package command. So once you've uh, generated the native image, um, all there's left to do is running the native image just as you run any other executable by calling dot slash and the path to wherever the native image is generated. Uh, we can even take this a step further by um, even containerizing the executable and um, leveraging the lower memory usage and fast startup times uh, when you're using applications on Cloud Run, for example, which is used to deploy and uh, run your containerized apps. So that's a bit um, about how you can use it with the client libraries. But what are the performance benefits we've observed? Um, in this slide, I've taken a snippet of um, the performance analysis that was conducted in a blog post announcing the support, uh, the native image support in the client libraries. Um, and the blog post actually did an analysis on an application which used a combination of two client libraries, um, PubSub, which is a messaging service, and Storage, which is a storage service as a name. 
represents. Um, and in that, in the performance analysis, um, the startup times was compared for the same application, both run in standard Java and as a native image, um, as a native image. Um, and as we can see here, the on average, the native image compiled app took about 0.6 milliseconds to start up, whereas the standard Java app actually took about 177 milliseconds, with about 86% of the native image startup times actually being under one millisecond, which is a pretty significant improvement. Um, similarly, uh, in terms of the memory usage, when the resident set size or the physical memory in RAM was measured for this, the two variations of the application, uh, we observed that the native image app took about 62.8 MB or 62,000 KB um, of memory, whereas the standard Java app used about 176 MB or 176,000 KB as seen here. Um, again, the native image app ended up using less memory than the standard Java app. Um, I do want to add a slight caveat though, that native image compilation works pretty well with um, short-lived workloads where your startup time actually has a huge impact on your application. Whereas with standard Java, it, there may be cases that are better suited for uh, standard Java, especially when you have more long running <laughs> workloads. Uh, so they both have their own use cases that, that would benefit from one technology or the other. Um, and finally, I have added a couple of links to um, some resources that you may find interesting, um, especially a link to a blog post if you're interested in learning more about how the performance analysis was done. Um, and also another link to the documentation page, which um, kind of delves deeper into the implementation side of things if you are interested in getting started with this uh, technology in the realm of the client libraries themselves. Um, I'm hoping the organizers who would be able to share it after the event. If not, uh, please do come talk to me. I would love to share the links with you. Um, and that's pretty much it for today. Thank you all so much. Hope you found this video. Email me the links and I'll put them on Twitter. Okay, for sure. Uh, Cammy's still here. Hmm? Uh, Thank you. Cool. So, oh, well, it's all yeah. okay. How are y'all doing? Um, Unmute, start video, and share screen. Share the whole screen. Yeah. All right, and then. All right, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, we are really honored uh, to be able to co to be able to sponsor like the space for the Java SIG. And um, this is such a weird angle this camera shot. Um, <laughs> yeah, <you can> see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so yeah, welcome to our VMware offices. Uh, you can, you're, there's a few snacks lying around. You're welcome to those. Uh, if you find some water, I think they emptied out this fridge, but um, you know, whatever you find that's edible here, <laughs> you're welcome to it. Um, we're also, uh, my coworker, uh, Gabri is not here tonight, unfortunately, but we are trying to, there was a, a cloud native meetup group. We will get a new logo. Please hold. 
Uh, but for now, we've got these gray clouds. But we're trying to get this group off the ground. It was started um, some years ago, and then kind of during COVID, it just sort of like crashed and burned. So we're trying to breathe new life into it. So we're also really grateful to the New York Java SIG for uh, supporting us and uh, letting us sort of co-promote this event. So, you know, just want to raise some awareness there. We have a couple of events coming up. Uh, one is March 9th and March 23. You can find those on the Meetup website. And um, <clears throat> I uh, I was going to do a, like a fully terminal window demo driven talk. And then I kind of was looking at some slides. So I think I'm going to a little bit improvise here and there about going from one presentation to another. Um, but I think it'll be okay. So uh, let's start here. So we're going to talk about cloud native build packs, which um, I guess who, how many people here are building images for their uh, Java applications? A few lines. Okay. A few people. Okay. Okay. And then what, so what are some of the ways that you're, what are, what are the mechanisms that you're doing that you're using? How do you build your images? Kubernetes. Like, uh, but do you use Docker files? Do you use other tools? Docker files? Everyone's using Docker files. Okay. Nobody's using any other tool. Okay. You use build packs. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, anybody heard of Jib? Jib. Okay. Have you used it? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> um, Jib is too opinionated. Build packs and Jib page like too opinionated. Build packs are too opinionated. Okay. I like, I like to do the part of the they are yes spring to support them yes okay cool all right so i'm glad that we have okay a little bit of a basis um okay so i'll be talking about cloud native build packs and then they are opinionated <laughs> so um the context i think one way to think about it is really like the what like why is it important right why like beyond like okay we have to build an image because there's no other way to put an application on kubernetes why should we care about how we're building the images, right? So if you think about it in the context of the role that your building image process plays in how secure your software supply chain is, right? Because, um, well, let's let's start there. That's going to be part of the agenda, right? And then we'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about Dockerfile and Jib and also Cloud Native Build Packs, and then we'll do a, some demos. We'll see how far we get. Uh, Frank, you can stop me if I go too long. So... So why is this important, right? So the container build process is actually a really key component of your secure software supply chain. And then as developers, you might also think, well, I don't, I don't really, you know, I'm not really involved in how an image is built in the software supply chain. I just need to do it on my laptop. But really the truth is that the way you build the image on your laptop, the closest you can get to how that image is built in the supply chain, the closer you are to mimicking on your computer what's going to happen in production, right? And so we, we, we can get away from these cases where it works in one environment and it doesn't work in another because we're building images in the same way. So, so we, want, we want those two to be as similar as possible. So, um, and the other important thing here is that, you know, when we did say like, you know, it works on my machine, it's because the environments were different, right? On your laptop versus uh, in production. But really as all of these dependencies that used to be here, you know, this used to be uh, 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 on the right I'm pointing, I guess, to the, to the Kubernetes thing for the people on video. Um, th this used to be VMs, right? And, and the operations team who, who was responsible for these VMs had to put the, the runtime there and the, and the shared libraries. And all of that has shifted left. And so now it's the responsibility of that build process to put all those things into a container. And so in effect, really your container is your production environment. And so that's the way to think about it, right? So you can have full control over that. Now, as that responsibility shifts further left into potentially your hands, um, you don't want all of the burden that was on the operation side of it. You don't want to feel that burden, right? What did we learn and how can we make this as easy as possible and secure and repetitive, uh, repeat, repeatable as, process, as possible for developers? So how, how are we going to do this? this? That is the big question. So as we think about the strategies that we have to build images, these are the things we want to consider, right? How consistent is it? between maybe different builds that you do for yourself or how different teams in your organization are building similar applications. How quickly can you build an image? How secure is that image that you're building? What are the governance considerations, right? Like if, you, if, if, if you're on the operations side of thing and you're, and you're managing a thousand containers, how do you know what's inside of them? How do you know which ones to patch, right? How do you know if some have vulnerabilities? Um, how easy is it to use this build tool? Because anything that's not easy is not going to be successful. Nobody's going to adopt something that's not easy to use, right? Um, how can you maintain it over time? 
and how does it interoperate with other parts of your secure supply chain? So these are all things to think about, meaning it's not enough just to produce an image, right? Um, and then the other thing I think that we can keep in mind in terms of like where sort of software supply chains are going, um, a lot of the traditional supply chains are really like end to end, right? You start here, you control the whole process. And so by the time your application gets to production, you know where everything came from because you've built everything. But the more we're using open source software um, and the more that maybe there's different ways of doing things, we're kind of seeing the industry go towards this attestation idea. So we're like, you could have a container image and you want to know from the container what's inside of this container, right? What's what's the, the proof that you're safe to put into my environment? So there's this idea of like, attestation right this this thing attesting to the fact that it passed security scans or you know that the contents of it are are uh, acceptable to your production environment um so when we're talking about building images we're talking about how can that built image uh val like uh speak for its provenance right where did all that software come from what's inside um and so your build system can help you attest to what is the source code that went into this what is the you know the shaw of the image and what is the bill of materials that's inside of your image right the um i don't know if you've heard of salsa salsa is like a set of i guess um rules or standards for secure i forget what it stands for secure software levels for secure artifacts or something like that um and so these ideas um uh, it's like different levels so the more levels you comply with salsa the more secure your software supply chain is and so these things if your build system can attest to these things those are like sort of things you can check off at salsa level 1 so, okay, so before I go into cloud native build packs, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. And let's talk about, so keeping all of that in mind, um, switch presentations for a second. Okay, so let's talk about Dockerfile. So Dockerfile, first of all, Dockerfile kind of precedes all of these uh, the attention that all of these ideas could have on the build process, right? Because as soon as there were containers, the first way to build them was to have a Docker file. And a Docker file is literally a script, right? Okay, it's not bash code, but it's literally a script. It's just that every line starts with a valid Docker file instruction. Um, so they're all every every Docker file you look at is a custom script. And the great thing about that is that it's custom, so you can use it for any kind of application you want. That's really powerful and it's really flexible speaking to like, you know, the opinionation of some of these other systems. So Dockerfile, if you ever come across a system that doesn't handle your application, you can do it with Dockerfile. But, um, so here's a, here's a really simple example, right? So you can see that the words in blue on the screen are the Dockerfile instructions. There's a set of, I don't know, 20, 30 valid Dockerfile instructions. Um, and you can start with like, you know, you start with an with an with a base image that already has a JRE, for example, you copy your jar into it, and then you set what the command is to start up your package. And that's and then you know, you 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 simply docker build and it produces an image. There are more sophisticated examples. So just in this one, you can see that here there's two blocks of code. So there's two from every every block, every stage, it's called a build stage. Every build stage starts with the word from what image you're starting off. So this one already has two. So the purpose of that first block is to build the Java code. So you can see in our last example, we were doing the Maven package on our computer. Sorry, so the build is happening on our local laptop, let's say. And then you build the image that you're gonna use for production. And that is based on a JRE. In the second example, we are starting our base image for the first one is actually a full JDK. So that inside of that image, we can actually run the Maven package. And then after that, we don't want the whole JDK in our production environment, right? So we just start with a new image that just has the JRE, and we copy from that first stage just the jar file. So this is called a, a two-stage build, and it's a little better because you can ensure that your runtime image doesn't have all of the utilities that you needed for the build environment, right? You would never put a JDK in your production environment. So, but again, you're starting to see, right? Like as you're writing Docker files, there's things you have to know. And well, I'll, I can... Um, I can go into, I, I'm going to show this again, actually. So I'm going to save some of the commentary. So, so those are some of the drawbacks, right? It's all of the, yeah. Was there a question? No. Okay. All of the responsibility is yours, right? Who chooses those base images that go in the from statement, right? What, uh, who's going to manage the version? Who's going to decide when they get updated? Um, how do you share this, right? You have other people on your team. Do you just like email them the file and everybody checks it into their own Git repo, how do you know how does that work at scale on an organization? 
Um, again, like if you have an image that was built by a Docker file, if you don't have that Docker file, how do you know what's inside of it, right? Putting on our sort of operator hats, do you let that into your production environment? And there's just a lot of reinventing the wheel because everybody, I'm sure every, every Docker file you've written, you've probably gone to the internet and kind of like started from scratch, right? So everybody is sort of reinventing the wheel. And so uh, at scale, you can end up with a lot of snowflakes and a lot of, a lot of risk ultimately. So um, at a certain point, you know, these problems are, are very, are, are real and they're very impactful. So JIB was one attempt to address some of these problems. JIB um, came out of Google and uh, JIB is specifically for Java. Docker file is for obviously any, any language. Uh, JIB was specifically in the uh, Java ecosystem. And so one nice thing about JIB is it doesn't require a Docker file. Um, it also doesn't require having the Docker daemon installed. You don't have to know how to use a Docker CLI. So it was trying to also kind of find a simpler um, user experience that sort of uh, meshed better with what a Java developer might be working with day to day. And so this, it was an integration with the Maven and the Gradle pl plugins. And one great thing is that it's it's fast and it produces images that have some optimizations for speed. And you can build an image with uh, Jib uh, several times and it's going to come out with the same digest reproducible meaning that if you if you rebuild the image it has the same shot right with the same code and the same the same configuration i guess so how does it work uh the gradle examples are in the documentation i'm using maven here um but you can see that it's uh so you would compile on your laptop uh similar to that first docker file we saw right where the compilation is happening on your machine and then you can call the build goal on the jib plugin and you can give the image that you want to produce you can give it a name um you can also instead of just building it and so the first example will actually build the image and push it to your repository right so you can see the address here has the registry the repository the image and the tag so this actually includes like the equivalent of a doc, of a docker push the second one is if you don't want to do that you just want it to be on your docker daemon in this case of course you do have to have docker but you can just build it locally. And finally, Jib also gives you the ability if you want to just produce a tarball that you can then load onto your Docker image, different way, different destinations for that image that's produced. Uh, of course, nobody wants to type all that. So you can put the, so, you know, you start to see here a pattern where you start to put the configuration into your POM file, beginning with like the basic, like this is the plugin I'm using. Maybe you combine this, the compile and the Docker build goals, you compile them so that it all happens during the package. All of that is possible. And so it becomes a really Maven package could produce your, your image, right? And so just to have a, a way to compare Jib and Dockerfile. So as I said, Jib does not use Dockerfile and it doesn't even have a Docker dependency. But in the FAQ on the um, GitHub directory for Jib, there, there somebody asked the question, what would a Dockerfile look like if Jib used Dockerfile. And so this is this was the answer from, from the Jib project. So you can see that, first of all, there's only one from statement, right? So that's already like telling us, and, and we saw in the previous command that you would have to do Maven compile build, right? So the build, the compile is happening on your local machine. So if you have a different version of Java on your machine than what's in the distro list image, you're gonna have two different versions of Java, right? So you already start to see that you're not fully controlling the build environment. Um, but I also mentioned that Jib has some optimizations, right? So you can see, for example, after it builds, so you've, you've built a jar file on your local machine, or, you, or you've actually, sorry, you've compiled the code on your local machine. What Jib does, which is interesting, is that it copies, there's uh, five copy statements, right? So first it copies dependency jars. So like, let's say your Spring Boot files, right? Your Spring Boot, your core Spring Boot files. Um, and then if you're using any snapshots, that's the next layer it does. and then uh, additional project dependency jar, jars, some resources, and finally your class files. So that last one is, is your actual code as a, as a developer that you're writing. And the reason that it does that is that this is true for, for Docker file as well. Um, when you build a Docker file, every instruction in the Docker file creates a layer on this image. And so if you go and change the from statement and everything else stays the same, you actually destroy the whole stack and you have to re, you have to recompile and rebuild and you know everything that you did. Um, and so, but if you only change the last layer, all of the others act as cache. So then the, the second build would be faster and safer because you didn't change what you didn't need to, what you didn't need to change. So the authors of Jib thought, 
the files that are going to change the most often are my class files. I'm not changing my Spring Boot version, you know, every day. So we're going to first create a layer with those uh, more stable files, and then the later la layers are going to be the ones that get changed more. So that so the rebuilds are faster, and it's also a bit safer. Um, you can see, I just, I guess, just keep this in mind. It copies a directory called source main jib, right? If you had anything there, that will go in the image. So that's a way to get stuff into the image. And then it defines here. I have the, I think I have these pointed out. So it, it so the other thing is it doesn't just put a jar file there, right? If you're, if you're going to write your own Docker file, your first instinct might be to, to just move the jar file into your image. So they don't do that. They unpack it. And that's because I think it's like, a, I forget the numbers, but like a 30% faster start time. If you unpack a 30%, so if you unpack your your jar your your Java files, so they they build that optimization in, and then the other thing that they do, right, the layers, right, so rebuilds are faster and safer, and then they also use the main class for startup, which is not as much of a lift as unpacking the files, but it's another little optimization built into Jib. Um, okay, so then, uh, so here's your your here's your images from Jib. I, these are built like the three different methods I said, right? One is pushed, one is built on the daemon, and one is a thing, but they're all the same image ID. So this is showing you how it's reproducible. No matter whatever goal you're using, and if you build it three times in a row, uh, you're going to get the same shot. And that's why it says it was created 50 years ago, uh, because in order to get that reproducible ID, you have to give up the modification, the timestamps on the files, and you have to give up the permissions on the files so that they're always the same. And so you you lose the, the date. But it's it's useful because you have the same image ID, which is really the way that a machine like Kubernetes can tell if it's the same image. So we, we want that image ID to be consistent. So that's a good thing. Um, as we saw already, uh, you know, well, the, so the, the configuration goes in your palm file. So here's some other examples. So if you want to if you want to modify this process. If you want to add labels to your image, if you want to change the default user, so like for example, here's a security improvement that's not built in, right? We want it to be a non-root user, so you have to put that into your palm file. If you forget that, then your image could be running as root. Um, that folder, that 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 copy statement that was in the pseudo Docker file, that's a way to get agents in. So it really it's beyond beyond that little assist of saying, hey, you put something here, I'll throw it in there. All the other configuration around that is up to you and it's built into your palm file. So everything is like that, JVM flags, ports, everything is in your, your palm file. So again, you start to see this problem of like, okay, well, my teammate needs to do this or how do I know that the other team is building it the same way? And suddenly, you know, at scale, it can again, start to get a little bit messy. You have um, spread. So that's, these are some of the drawbacks of, of JIB, right? It's, it's a really, it's it's useful, but it's, but it's pretty primitive in a certain way. So, um, Okay, so cloud native build pack. So now I'm gonna switch, sorry, one more time, I'm gonna switch slides here. Because I think these were a little more condensed. Okay, so cloud native build packs. Uh, yeah, okay, so cloud native build packs. I don't think I have the history. Yeah, I don't have the history of them here. Um, no, actually, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna switch back to the other one because it has more detail. I'll tell you a little bit about the history. I wasn't gonna go into this much detail, but um, let's talk a little bit of history. So how many of you have heard of, of well, Cloud Foundry and Heroku, is there any Cloud Foundry Heroku users here? Okay. So if you so if you know Heroku, then the word build pack is probably familiar to you, you know, ever since you heard of Heroku. So Heroku in 2011 came up with this idea of build packs, where you just give it the source code and it builds the thing for you, right? And in those days, it wasn't, build packs didn't produce an, an OCI compliant image because that didn't exist in 2011. Um, so it predates, right? Docker file, Kubernetes, all that stuff. Um, Pivotal uh, or VMware actually initially uh, really embraced this idea and produced a product called Cloud Foundry that followed the same philosophy. And so for a long time, Heroku and Cloud Foundry were developing and, and selling and, and being successful with producing these build packs. And so that each one has basically put years between 2011 and 2018 at least put a lot of years and uh and sort of cycles into producing build packs that were good at building applications of different kinds java node whatever 
And so a build pack is simply something that takes source code and it turns it into a pseudo container like thing that either runs in Cloud Foundry or it runs in Heroku. And it had the advantages of like being consistent and repeatable and it was something centralized. And so you always knew what was in your images. But it had a few problems, right? Like if you're not using Heroku or if you're not using Cloud Foundry, then you can't use build packs. And, and in that concept is actually uh, underneath that is also like some sort of tightly coupled code where like the platform that's actually uh, orchestrating the build of your source code into an image is baked into Cloud Foundry or uh, or Heroku, right? So there weren't clear levels of abstraction. Kevin, thank you for coming. Um, there weren't like um, levels of abstraction built into the platforms that were good enough to kind of like separate the two. So, um, and and they there wasn't even like Heroku and Cloud Foundry kind of went their own ways a little bit. They weren't using a single standard API. So there was like some, you know, some disadvantages. Every build pack was a monolith. It was hard to, to kind of customize. So in 2018, after, you know, obviously Dockerfile and or Kubernetes and containers were, you know, they, they, they really took over and they advanced uh, Heroku and Pivotal and VMware at that point, no Pivotal at that point, got back together and they said, okay, let's, let's revisit this project and let's, let's, um, let's do, let's create a version of it that is uh, intended for Kubernetes and the container ecosystem. And let's take advantage of this opportunity also to improve some of those limitations that we've had over the last few years. That, that was how Cloud Native Build Packs was born. And so that was 2018. It's part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation now. And so one of the things that they set up was this project called buildpacks.io. And so what buildpacks.io is, is a definition of the API. So they looked at the abstraction layers and like how to orchestrate a build, no matter what you're building, just the, the mechanism of orchestrating it. And they developed a few APIs around that. And those standards and ideas are part of what's called buildpacks.io. And so then you as a, as, you know, can go and implement the APIs that they provided, and you can come up with either a set of build packs. So I have build packs that build Java apps, or I have build packs that build Node apps, or you can implement a different API and come up with like an orchestration platform, right? Oh, I want to do it with a CLI, or I want to do it through like, I don't know, a, a button or a REST API or however you want to do it. Um, and then they added some more features um, like, you know, uh, like to swap out the operating system without having to lose the other layers that, you know, it was, it was much more modern. So that's how Cloud Native Build Packs were born. And um, so, okay, so uh, when you're working with Build Packs, um, there's this idea of the platform, and then there's like, the idea of the individual build packs that you're using. Um, let me actually do this with a demo. How am I doing on time? Fine. Fine. Can, okay. All right. Just trying to figure out how the best. Okay. So let me let me let's let's switch to demo and see how this works. We can go back to slides if we need to clarify anything. So is that big enough? Yeah. Okay. So. Let me put this, I want to do this like in comparison to Dockerfile again, because that's what most people are, are used to, right? Um, so like a typical Docker command that you would run would be Docker build. The dot means where's my source code. So I'm in my current directory, you give your image a name using the minus T flag, which means tag, and then, you know, the Docker file. So, uh, so here's, well, here's one Docker file. Let me show you. Let's go to the, that's the single, you know, there's only one from statement there, right? So we talked about that a little bit. So here's another one that has the two from statements. So one one environment to build and one environment to for your for the th for the runtime that you're actually going to put into production. So with build packs, we have different sort of um, elements that uh, work to to make build packs uh, what they are. We have a platform, we have base images, we have a life cycle, and we have build packs. So what if we were to compare? There's not necessarily always a, a you know if you're if you're too sort of like detailed you can like break these comparisons but like what would what would they be so the base images that's the easy one well, easy one right ba base images are what image you're starting with so images is plural so we have two just as in a two-stage docker file we have one base image that works as our um build environment and then we have a slimmer uh base image that has less things on it where we're going to transfer the stuff that we built and that's what we want to put into production so there's two base images build and run um, the set of build packs, the build packs are the modules that know what to do with your source code, right? So if you are building a Java file, there's going to be 
a, um, a build pack for uh, Java that's going to download a JRE or and a JDK. If you're a node, it'll do something different, right? There'll be a Maven build pack or a Gradle build pack, depending on what your app is, right? So all of these work together. So the build packs are basically, let's say, all of the other instructions that know how to build your application. Um, the life cycle, the the life cycle. Let's do the life cycle. Um, or let's just do the platform first. The platform is the tool that you, as an end user, or your or in your supply chain, that you use in order to run the build packs against your source code to produce an image. And that platform uh, can be if if you're using a CLI. There's a CLI, for example, that if you use that, then that's your most similar experience to a Docker build command. So like Docker is kind of your plat. Docker is not really your platform, but let's say. Docker is the tool you're using from a user experience perspective. What happens with Docker build is actually that it's not the CLI that's doing doing anything. The CLI communicates with the Docker daemon, and the the source code gets pushed. The source code and the Docker file get uh, pushed to the daemon, and the daemon executes the Docker file against the source code. So really, it's the daemon that's orchestrating the build, right? Uh, and the and Docker is your, your your CLI. So that's where there's not a really direct comparison, but the platform let's say is the user tool. So it could be a CLI and the life cycle is the code that actually executes that orchestration. So it knows how to apply the source code or there it's the, yeah, it's like the pieces of the implementations that, that can take the build packs and apply them on your source code. And so the platform and the uh, orchestrates a life cycle in order to do it. So that's how kind of how it works. Good so far. Okay, cool. So um, the most similar experience you can get to Docker build is pack build, where pack is your platform. The build is the build command within the pack CLI. Uh, the next thing is just the name you're giving the image, and then you're choosing a builder. And the builder is basically an OCI image that is uh, built on. So it's the it's the build image and it has the lifecycle software installed in it, and it has all of the build packs in it. So rather than having to pull all these four pieces together, all you do is specify a builder and you get the other three. So it, whether you're using the CLI with the builder or some other tool with the builder, you can have different user experiences, but as long as you're using the same builder, you're gonna produce the same result, which is really cool because on your laptop, you can use the CLI and then your tool chain could use something native in Kubernetes that uses the same builder and you're both gonna produce the same image, right? So suddenly we're like approaching the thing you build is similar to what's gonna run in production. So, uh, so let's go ahead and run that. Um, and that's gonna build, okay, so it will, it's gonna, it's gonna build a Java file. So. Java. So, you know, that takes a couple of minutes, but we can kind of walk through it. So first of all, when we say that the platform orchestrates the life cycle, we mean that the, so there's different APIs in the life cycle. And so the platform has to say, do this now, do that now, do that now. So PAC is saying, do, anal do analyze first and then do detect and then do restore. There's an order to them, right? Um, this is the first time I'm building this image on this machine. Sometimes, you know, since I have a, since I got the M1, I've been, sometimes sometimes it's a bit, my computer kind of acts up a bit, so hopefully that'll go okay. Um, but you can see that I didn't, like I, it's, so if you're familiar with Heroku and Cloud Foundry, this, this will, this will be familiar, but like, I didn't tell it that it was a Java app. I didn't tell it that it was a Spring Boot app, and I didn't tell it that it was a Maven app, right? Basically, there's a set of build packs inside of that builder to handle a number of different applications. And it kind of figured that out by itself. That's the detection stage. So it kind of presents the source code to each of the build packs. And it says, is this for you? Is this for you? Is this for you? And each set of build packs can look at it. And the first set that matches, that's the one that gets to process the application. So the Java build packs were the first in the list that recognized the source code and said, yes. And you can see the choice uh, like if I had if I had a jar file in my local directory, then then you wouldn't have like the Maven build pack participating because it doesn't have to build anything, right? So it's so it's a uh, it's very specific to the source code there. So there's that detection process, and then for every build pack that's selected during the build stage, every one of those is applied to the source code in source code in order, and each build pack can produce one or more layers. Um, so for example, this build pack for, this is the Bellsoft Liberica build pack. This downloads the JVM and the JRE. You can see it has a default version of Java 11, but if I set this environment variable, I can tweak that version. 
um, and so some other things, right? Um, and you can see that they're contributing to the layers in the application. Um, what else can I point out here? So uh, SIFT. So SIFT is one of the standards for a, for a software bill of materials. So you can already see that this is already also gonna produce for us a bill of materials for the application. So that's useful. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The Maven build pack, this is where sometimes it gets stuck. Um, but you can see that the, the default Maven command that it's running, uh, it skips tests. It's assuming that your CI process did that. Uh, but you, again, you have, uh, you have control over that. And uh, okay, hopefully that finishes. If not, I'll try to, I'll do it again. So while that's running, I'll show you this a little bit in slide format. Okay, so so as we said, right? There's two main. There's other there's other parts of the project, but but more importantly, we have a platform and we have build packs. So the platform is the the thing you interact with, right? The tool that you use in order to get this to work, and the build packs are the modules that know how to uh, process the source code. And then uh, the life cycle is that implementation uh, that helps the platform to orchestrate the build packs. Right. It's kind of like the sort if, if like 10 people orchestrate, if 10 people built platforms and 10 people build build packs, the life cycle is the code that you would all have to write. And so the project basically said, here's the common code and, and supplied it. It's like a reference implementation, but it's what's used. All of that is located on the build image to create this builder. And then it transfers. It has a reference to the run, run image. And at the end, it transfers. Right. So that's the builder image. And then. Um, so this is also like their open API. So this is a growing ecosystem. So this is the last I checked. Um, Pack is the, the reference implementation from the Build Packs project. Uh, it's a CLI. KPAC is something that if you want a, an experience that's close to Heroku or close to uh, Cloud Foundry, then you can install KPAC. It's a Kubernetes native operator uh, that will act autonomously. It'll look at your Git repositories. And when there's a Git commit, it'll build images and push them to your registry. Um, and so you see there's there's a few more ways. There's like a tech on task in the catalog. So there's a few more ways. Uh, the VMware ones are the uh, VMware is obviously commercial supersets of of the open source that that we produce. And then there's implementations of the build packs API. So um, Paketo build packs is the evolution of what was the Cloud Foundry build packs. They had a, a, just a, a name rebranding there. Uh, Heroku is still Heroku build packs. And then there's uh, a couple more, as I said, uh, oh, sorry, these are, these are commercial products. VMware Tanzu is a superset of a commercial superset of the Paketo ones, of the, of the old Cloud Foundry ones. Um, okay. So then let's see how our demo is doing. Any questions so far? Oh, okay. So this is not working. So let me try this. I'm just going to do it one more time because sometimes it works on the second. Try. I don't know why I just kind of get stuck. Give it a chance. Any questions in the meantime? Okay. Does this so far look like something that might influence your next time you sit down to write a Docker file? <laughs> Maybe you'd install the Pax CLI. Not yet. Yes. Okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so hopefully this will build, and I'll show you that demo. Yeah. So Spring Boot. So so as we saw, the nice thing about Jib is that Jib is uh, using Jib is built into the Maven and the Gradle plugins, right? So what Spring Boot did eventually was to support cloud native build packs uh, via the Spring Boot Maven and Gradle plugins, um, and so 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 also as we mentioned, right? You can you can you can be a platform. And you still have a choice of builder. So with Spring Boot, you could choose any builder that you want. But by default, the builders that that are used in 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 Spring Boot are the Paketo build packs. Uh, so so again, if you build it with Spring Boot or if you build it with a Pax CLI, as long as you're using the same builder, the same version of the same builder, then you should produce the same result. All right. So we'll give Maven another another chance here. And if not in the meantime, so in the meantime, while this is doing that, I could so I, so I have two lines of demos for you. If if there's time, you can always stop me. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So if, yeah, it's all depending on this, this build. So the other thing I want to, I would like to demo for you is how this works on Kubernetes. Is that of interest or, or your, yes. Okay. It's better when these uh, two demos work in sequence, because then you have the background of the first one, but I feel like I've explained enough. So, uh, so let's say, okay, so I'll show you all the stuff uh, in the other one, but eventually let's say you want to uh, do this for uh, at scale. And so you actually, what you actually want is some process running somewhere in Kubernetes that can just monitor your applications. And when you do a git commit, it reacts to that and it bu builds an image and then pushes it to your registry. So in that case, uh, let me just make sure I'm logged into Docker. Okay. So on Kubernetes, somebody has to install KPAC. So this, this is done with this product called KPAC. Somebody has to install KPAC. It's really easy. It's just one kubectl apply YAML file. But, um, but let's say in an enterprise, you would have an operator's point of view, and then you would have a developer point of view, right? So from an operator point of view, you have to install KPAC. And then uh, with KPAC, you don't just use the publicly available Paquetto images, but you can use you can kind of use those to create to move them into a registry of your own. And so you're kind of using your own builders, but uh, but it doesn't take a lot to do that. You can just kind of uh, you just sort of like re you're, yeah you're just like reusing those for yourself. Um, so it's just a few commands to do that, which I'm not really going into here. But at the end of that, you have a builder in your own registry uh, that is equivalent. So then we can move on to like from the developer point of view. So from a developer point of view, I create a resource on Kubernetes called an image. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the image and every Git repository for my, that I, that I uh, want to build from. So I would say KP image create, give it some kind of name. And I would uh, produce the, the tag of where I want to eventually push the images and I can specify and move this. Um, the builder I'm using, right? So we saw that the the operator had created a builder. So there's an object in Kubernetes of type cluster builder, and the name of it is builder. So it's this is an internal reference to something in Kubernetes. And then I'm saying, where's my source code? So my source code is is at that address. So then, uh, so then this it's, it's basically a record of the application that we want to build. And at that point, it's hands off, right? I can go, I can. Uh, write some code, I can do a git commit and I can go get coffee because I'm expecting Kubernetes to monitor every five minutes. It's going to check my git repo and it's going to notice it and it's going to do something about it. So the way that it happens, if I look at the status, I can see that it's building. This is because I just, I just created it. I didn't do a git commit, but obviously the first time you create the image, it counts as well. So it's in the middle of the build. So um, the other way to do this would be right now I'm telling it to go basically uh, look at the main, you can see, right? Revision is main. So it's it's just saying like, if there's a git commit in the mm -hmm. main branch, but let's say you don't want it to do that. Let's say you still want to use build packs, but you don't want it to be every git commit, right? You want it to be only stuff that has passed your testing CI process. So you can actually use, uh, you can just declare a revision the first time you do it, or you can, from your CI, after the testing is done, your CI could issue the command to patch the image, to patch the revision uh, number. And so then you only build the revisions that you wanna build. So I'm not gonna run that one, but just, just so you know, you have a little more control. And then, um, so I built another one just so to save time. You could look at the logs. So here are the logs. This one is a Go application actually, uh, but, uh, but you can see here that in the case of here, you're using one more life cycle stage. But otherwise, you have the analyze, the detect, uh, the analyze and restore are things for reusing cache, so subsequent builds are faster, and then uh, applying each of those during the build stage. So it's the same kind of log output, right? That we that we were starting to see. The export is taking the layers from the builder image, putting them into the runtime image to produce that final image that we want, and finally, um, it does a push to uh, to our Docker repository. So that's the build there. Just let me check back on this one, how this one's doing. Oh, it's still stuck. Oh, I don't know what happened. All right, we'll deal with that in a second. Okay. Um, and then the other interesting thing here is that, uh, so, so it's that easy, right? If I were to do a git commit, I check and there's another build. And the way that this happened actually is the 
So there's an image resource. And every time that there's a git commit, it's going to create a second resource called a build that's going to manage that specific build for that application. And then that build is going to spawn a pod. And the build actually happens on the pod. And then the last, I think, 10 builds are, are those pods are stick around so you can still see the log files. And you know, all of this is configurable. Um, something really interesting is, is a rebase. So in Dockerfile, if you have to change the operating system, you have to change the from statement, which means you just lost all of your layers, right? So here, um, uh, Cloud Native Build Packs is taking advantage of some characteristics of, I think, the V2 registry um, uh, behaviors, I guess, and, and using that to just swap out the OS layer without having to rebuild all of the application layers. And so when you're working with KPAC, it's as easy as saying, okay, so let's say we have three images. Um, this is the one that, uh, so, so I, I pre-built two of them, and this is the one we, we built at the beginning of this demo. And um, you can see that the reason that they were all built is, is config, which basically means a configuration of a Kubernetes object, which may, means you just created this, right? Or you, 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 you uh, yeah, you just created this, right? As opposed to like something like a, a git commit. So uh, for each of these have only been built once. So if we, we list the builds for each one of these images, there has only been one build. So if I change the stack and I say, okay, there's been just an update of the operating system or there was a vulnerability found in the operating system. And in this case, the Paquetto project released a new uh, operating system with a patch. All I have to do is uh, on the object that represents that stack, I have to say, I want to update that with this new image that I obtained from Paquetto or from VMware or from whoever. And that will trigger a change in Kubernetes that causes Kubernetes to recreate the builder image. And so that that and that change then triggers a rebuild of all of the images that use that builder. All of this just hands off by just running this one command. So right now it's saying, okay, we're going to pr provide this new builder. We update that cluster stack object in Kubernetes. We're just going to give it a second or two to uh, update that cluster builder object in Kubernetes that points to this uh, stack. And then we should see that that triggers. So there we go. So that's triggered. So for all three images, so imagine this is happening for a thousand images at a time. All you did was update the OS and immediately KPAC says, I'm going to rebuild all of these images. Um, and so you can see that uh, is the, yeah, so let me make this a little bit smaller. You can see the reason. So the reason for the first three builds was config. The reason for the second build is it's stack change, right? Uh, commit is another one that you can see. Um, and so then we, if we look at the log file for one of them, this log file is going to be very different from the log file that we looked at for a build because it's it's very quick and it didn't rebuild anything. It doesn't go through the build packs. It literally just goes because an OCI image at the end of the day, it's a, it's a manifest file that's pointing to layers. And so it's just really updating the manifest file and swapping out the OS layer. Um, so it's really quick. So now we've got uh, I think that's it for that demo. So let's see if if I can show you the local. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. I could try it one more time. Um, but I think I think we I mean we covered a lot of ground. But yeah, there's definitely cool stuff to show you here. So let me just see if that's that's. Let's try this one more time. Any questions on that? All right, we'll give it. We'll give that one more shot, and then. Um, in the meantime, I can show you. So this would be like, just what we just saw, right? That rebase is an OCI image. is basically a manifest file that's pointing to different layers. It points to the base layers for the operating system, and it points the, to the application layer. So every layer that was added by a build pack, and so if your run image is found to have a vulnerability, then you can uh, obtain a new run image from your build packs provider. And there's something called an application binary interface compatibility between the base image and the rest of the layers. So that guarantees that you can swap out that bait, that operating system layer and still uh, not affect the, the functionality of the application layers. So when you do that, then KPAC would go, well, you can do this with the CLI. You can do this on your computer as well with the CLI. But so the rebase operation, I should say, um, takes that manifest file and updates the pointers 
to the layer. So you're still pointing at the same app layers and you're, you just point to the new one. So it's really the safest and quickest way. Um, and if you're doing it at the CLI, it would just be a pack rebase operation. Um, so that's KPAC with this declarative configuration model. It's an autonomous behavior. Uh, it's very efficient um, and it works and KPAC will react. So if you do a git commit of your code, it'll rebuild your image. If you fix, if you uh, change the stacks, it'll rebuild your image. And if there's a Java update or a node update or something like that, and the build packs change, then again, same thing, right? You update the build packs that causes a new builder. And so then all of the applications that were built using those, uh, that builder, uh, that will also, uh, so if you have a build packs change, it will also cause um, an automatic rebuild. So that's really useful. Which one? <laughs> the consistent rebuild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to check one more time. Let's see. I'm so sorry that doesn't work. I, it's a little finicky, but it was definitely working. Oh, it worked. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I thought I knew, and I knew it was like a little asking for trouble getting an M1, but you know. <laughs> so okay, so we did the pack, and you guys have energy. I'm not. Nobody's like falling asleep yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so here we go. So we did a pack. So this is again very similar to Docker build, right? So it's not going to be very different. Pack build the image name and what builder we want to use. You can actually set this as your default builder. So you just do pack build and the name of the image. Uh, so you can see here nothing in analyzing and restoring because this is the first time we're building it here. So there's nothing to use as cache. Uh, so it detects that it's going to use 10 different build packs and then it applies them one by one. The Java build pack in particular is awesome. And it has like um, uh, the environment variables that are just in, like, it's so easy to see how you can configure it and what you can configure because it's all right here. Um, but the default behavior is great. Um, and then you see, we pointed out the SIFT stuff, Maven acts finally. Okay, so the build is happening on the builder image, right? Not on your local computer. So that's one thing. And then we have, um, Spring Boot stuff. So, okay, so here's one interesting thing. So, what we saw in Jib, where it moves the unpacked uh, compile comp comp compiled files into different layers, so that you only change. You, you still have to like if you need to change a layer, that layer goes away. So, um, Cloud Native Build Packs uh, or Spring Spring Boot does the same thing. So, if you're using and you don't have to be using the Maven Gradle plugin for Spring Boot, just as long as you're using Build Packs to build a Spring Boot application, it will also do that. It will divide your application files in four different uh, layers with your um, class files, your personal class files being separate. So you only have to bust that layer if you change some code you wrote. Um, it also adds labels. It does some nice things. And then it exports everything, uh, meaning your from the build image to the run image. And, uh, and then it, um, in this case, it just puts it on the Docker daemon. You, there is a push command. So you could do pack, build, and then push. Um, so at the end of that, on our local Docker, we're gonna have, so this is the image we just built. And you can tell by the date 43 years ago that it's following also that jib philosophy of, right? Like if you want it to be repeatable, you have to give up the um, the timestamp and the permissions. So uh, I don't know how they came up with 43. I don't know how jib came up with 50, but like uh, clearly all of this has happened in the last five minutes. And um, so, but also we we did download that builder image and then the run image right to where things were transferred. So it's it's it does have to download all those components. Um, okay, so here's I want to show you a few other things that it does. So we talked about how does this help you with like knowing what's in the image, right? Um, because if you have uh, if you have a Docker image built by Docker file, you can tell a little bit about what's in there, but really not a lot, and unless you have that original Docker file. So um, pack, uh, cloud native build packs, in, uh, produces, create, generates, uh, or the build packs within uh, cloud native build packs have the possible, have the, uh, ability to create a software bill of materials. So in your choice of build packs, you should choose one that's doing it. That should be what it's, what, it, what, what they do, right? So if you use Paquetta ones, definitely do that. I would assume, uh, any updated ones do as well. So you can, um, extract the bill of materials from the image. It's packaged into the image, meaning you don't have to have anything except that image that you're about to deploy and you can query the image itself and extract that information. When you extract that information, 
what it does is export this directory of files. So I just did a tree of that of the directory that it created. And you can see that there's some files that are, that are .sift and there's some .cdx. So it's producing uh, a, a bill of materials in two different formats. So if your software supply chain needs one format of, or the other, you have the information in there. And then I'll just show you a couple of them as an example. Again, you know, what's in these files depends on the build packs that you've chosen. But if we look, for example, at the Bellsoft, at the one produced by the Bellsoft Liberica build pack in the Picada build packs, you would know what, you know, what's your JRE? What version is it, right? So here's a lot of information that would be good to know if you're in operations. Do I need to patch this? Does this have a vulnerability? Um, and then if we look at the one from, I think it was the Spring Boot one, or the executable jar one. Here, so if, even if you look at a POM file, right, you have some level of information, but it's but this really explodes all of the detail. And so every Java library, like here, you know, Tomcat and Ben WebSocket, like every Java library in their version. Uh, obviously, the Spring Boot ones were here. So if you wanted to know what version of Spring Boot, it's a little hard to find, but like what version of Spring Boot, um, it's all in here. So, but for, from an operations point of view, it's this is really powerful, right, to know exactly what was in there. Sort of, you know, the log4j issue, for example, if you could just scan all of your images, you would know exactly which ones are, are vulnerable. Um, you can do inspections on the image. Of course, you know, any Docker, it's it's an OCI image. So you can do a Docker, a Docker inspect command here as well. But uh, you can also do a pack inspect. And a pack inspect gives you information like uh, what is the stack that is being used, including even the reference SHAs for it? What build packs were used to build this particular image? What versions? Where can you get more information about these, right? Because they're all uh, open source. And then what is the, the I guess, the, the, the process type that it's using, right? Um, you can also actually run that command against the builder to see, you'll see it's, it, you know, how many languages it supports, et cetera. Um, you can look at, so there's this tool called Dive. Are you guys familiar with Dive? Has anybody used Dive? Dive is so nothing to do with built packs. You can do this on a Docker image as well. But Dive is a tool that lets you look at the layers inside of an image. And so I just want to show you like how organized uh, this image is. So I'm just going to uh, tab over to the right and hit Control U for a second, because I only want, so on the left there, you see all of the images in the, in the in all of the layers in the image. And as I move down the stack on the left, you're going to see here, uh, appear what that layer in particular is adding. So I'll just move down. Some of these are like the base sort of like, uh, sort of OS things. And then let me move this. You start to see layers that, you know, you start to see the word Paquetto. So you start to see, okay, this layer was added by that particular build pack. So that's the CA certificates build pack. Um, you'll get, this is the Liberica build pack. You'll see here, okay, so here's the JRE. So the Bellsoft Liberica build pack added a few different layers, the organized stuff, and here's the JRE that it put there. And then I wanna get to that, um, here's some Spring Boot stuff, but here, uh, so here's the SBOM stuff, right? It's a layer in there. And then here's, so here's what it means when, because this was a Spring Boot app that's taking advantage of the layering that Spring Boot, Spring Boot can do, what that meant for this app, which is just a little hello world app, is that we created a 20 megabyte layer that has your basic Spring Boot files. Um, and then some spring uh, loader files, spring boot loader files. Then we have a zero byte file because I don't have any snapshot libraries in this application. And then a bit uh, like a sub 10 kilobyte layer that has the actual code. So now if I just change my source code, these 10 kilobyte, this one layer gets recreated. And which also, it's not just that the build is faster, it's that even the network transfer is faster because when, in, when a Docker image is, tra is transported, from uh, one from your, your Docker daemon to a registry or from one registry replicated to another registry, any any push or pull that you do, uh, it goes in layers. And if a layer didn't change, it doesn't get translate transported over the network anymore either. So now imagine if you have like an edge net one, some edge setup where you have all of these little Docker uh, registries all over the world. If you just change some code, you don't have to transport, you know, uh, hundreds of megabytes, you're just trans transporting some kilobytes to all of your edge locations. So it can be pretty meaningful actually. Uh, okay, so I'm going to quit out of this. And um, I have a few more things to show. So OS patching. So we saw that. I'll show it to you quickly here. Um, so this would be the equivalent of what we saw with KPAC, right? Where, it's, you know, there's some, something was wrong with the uh, base image. So I get a new one from my vendor or from my provider. And um, in this case, I'm just going to tag it so it looks like it's the latest one. I'm just re-tagging re it locally so that when I run when I run a pack rebase command, 
Um, it should be just this very short. And this is this takes like, I don't know, five, six seconds on your local machine. It's faster on, on Kubernetes. It just is a little bit more efficient. But again, really short log file, just swapped out that base operating system, uh, system layer without having to rebuild anything. Um, custom build packs. So one of the big challenges with Heroku and Cloud Foundry build packs was that they were so difficult to uh, modify because the Java build pack was this huge monolith. If you forked that or changed it, then suddenly you know you had to you and and then you know the the original one was was um, revised. Then it was on you to kind of like sort those things out. It could get really messy. So that was one of the things that was improved. So there is actually a sample build pack provided by the build packs IO. Uh, it's in the, the in the buildpacks.io um, GitHub site. So if I just look at this hello world build pack example, in that it has two in it, and it has a bin directory where it has two executable files. One is called build and one is called detect. So basically, as that lifecycle is executing, if you if you say I want these uh, custom build packs to participate, it'll call the detect script. And, the, and then your build packs can look at the source code and say, oh, I want to act on this or I don't want to act on this. And if you do, if you return yes, then you will be included in the build plan. And then if you are included in the build plan, when your turn comes, your build script will be run. And then you will be able to act on the, on the source code and produce layers. What you put into these two scripts is up to you, right? They're just binary. So you can write them in any language you want. You can do whatever you want. Um, so... I'm not going to go into the details of that, but just to show um, how you how easy it is to incorporate them, at least here on the uh, at the CLI. So again, I'm running that pack build command. Same, I'm using the same image name because I, I don't want to rebuild the whole thing. I want to use the cache layers to make it faster. And I'm saying that first, I want to run the build packs that are coming from the builder. Hi, okay, and then. I want to add my custom build pack. And in this case, my custom build pack is just here as code on my machine. This can be pointing to an image. It can be different things. So I'm going to rebuild that image that we built. This time, a couple of things. First of all, we do see that uh, it, during the analyzing, it is restoring data. Uh, during um, restoring, it is saying, I don't have to redo these things because I can use re reuse cache. So it doesn't have to, all of these build packs are just saying reusing cache. Re re reusing cache. And then we'll let the Maven build pack do its thing, which is just realize that it has to use cache in a second, hopefully. And then at the end, so what, we'll, what we should see shortly, hopefully, is that um, our custom build pack gets called. And all that that one is doing is um, publishing some stuff to the output just to prove that it's working, hopefully. If that doesn't, if that doesn't work within, let's say, a minute, uh, it, yeah, this shouldn't be happening. I don't know what, why it's getting stuck. Then the only thing that I haven't shown you, which I can show you, uh, let's get out of here then, just in case. So that would just rebuild that. And so if that didn't work, the only thing I would be missing uh, is the Spring Boot demo, which, uh, yeah, so this is literally the only command that I'd be missing. So we can do that in the meantime in a different window. Mm, hide this stuff. Um, use this one. So, Where were we? Hello, Java app. Okay, and before I run that, let me just check. Yeah, so this is stuck. I don't know why. So the so the only difference is uh, if you were using Spring Boot, then Spring Boot has built this um, goal into the into its um, plugins called Build Image, and we can just skip tests. And the only way this is different. Uh, really from using pack is that in this case, uh, it does do the Maven build on your local machine, sort of a little bit like Jib was doing, right? So first it compiles on your local machine. And then after that, it'll um, call the the build goal. And so at this point, we wouldn't need the Maven build pack because because the code is already compiled. So it uses one build pack less to do it. Um, 
So that's that's really the only difference. But but it's it is that easy that command. So it's just a question of letting. I don't know why this is stuck. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but you can see now that it's invoked the build pack stuff. Uh, that it's the same output. Uh, it's just going to skip. You can see here, for example, that there is no Maven build pack in this selection because it compiled locally. So that's that's the difference. But otherwise, it's the same. And so, and also with Spring Boot. Uh, you don't have to give it a name. It'll just choose from your palm. You can override it, but by default, it'll name the image uh, using your artifact name and version from your Palmer Gradle file. Uh, yeah, so this one's done. I don't know. I Sorry, the other one's stuck, but that's the only thing. That <laughs> um, that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Barb. Thank that you. Was, uh, fantastic. So for three full tools in one night. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you again to VMware for hosting us. And we'll see everybody next month. Thank you. Cool. Oh, 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 oh.